Hey there, how-to listeners. Before we start the show, I want to let you know about a story coming up a little later. It's from one of our partners, SAP. AI comes at you fast. If you don't get reliable and relevant advice, your business might miss out. Whether you're looking to automate tasks or embed AI in your business processes, SAP can help. To learn more, head to sap.com slash AI and stick around for expert advice on how to embrace AI with confidence. This episode is brought to you by Splunk. You need to keep operations humming around the clock, but potential disruptions are everywhere. Splunk helps you predict problems and find and fix issues fast, so you can reduce risk and ditch downtime. The world's largest enterprises rely on Splunk's unified security and observability platform to become more efficient, resilient, and innovative. With Splunk, you can react quickly, evolve faster, and be ready for anything. Stay ahead of disruptions. Learn more at splunk.com slash resilience. It's a visceral loss. And the scientific part of my brain wants it to make sense, at least. Because there's a little cognitive dissonance that I did nothing wrong that I'm aware of. And yet I feel a little punished for it. Welcome to How To, I'm Courtney Martin. Today is the third and final episode in our friendship series. We would genuinely love to hear from you about your hard-earned friendship wisdom or any questions you have. The How To hotline is always open at 646-495-4001 or email us at howtoatslate.com. Now, this week's listener, Alice, wrote in with what feels like a perfect culmination to the series. What to do when a friendship, one you value deeply, suddenly disappears. I'm going to hand things over to my co-hosts, Carvel Wallace and Alice, to fill us in on the split. I am Alice, and I am a stay-at-home mom with three kids, teenager age, and I drive taxi. So Alice, you're here because you have a very specific conundrum that you would like advice on. Can you give us the background on this story? Yes. My daughter started dating, I guess, middle school, a boy. It's a small school and she's known him since they were in second grade. And the parents, I've always wanted to get to know better. And this gave us the reason to get to know each other better. Uh, And then COVID struck and the mom of the boy became sort of a foxhole friend of mine. The benefit of COVID was that our children couldn't be close to each other. They couldn't smooch or anything. (laughs) During COVID, uh, relationships were strained in her family. They were strained in my family. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. we were both feeling betrayed, actually, uh, by family who would Mm -hmm. throw away the relationship just because Mm -hmm. there would be a mask that had to be Mm -hmm. worn. We were extremely close. When she had a health scare... I took care of the kids. Mm, mm-hmm. And so we told each other just about everything. What did that friendship give to you? What did you love about it? What was your relationship like? I felt the total freedom to be myself. Uh, we laughed a lot. When things get us down, the other can always bring us up with recognizing the absurdity of the situation and the humanity in the situation. Um, it went on for a couple years, almost three years. And then my daughter broke up with the boy. And I was not expecting for my friend to end our friendship. And we used to joke about how our kids would go their separate ways and do college, maybe graduate school. They would come home for Christmas, rekindle whatever they had, and we could raise grandbabies together. That was our (laughs) silly little fantasy. But we saw a future. And then when this happened... Her son, when she asked, would it be weird if I stayed friends with Alice, said yes. And Mm -hmm. I suppose when your son asks you for solidarity, you give him solidarity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But other than that, I am mourning this friendship. I want to fight for this friendship, but it's not reciprocated. Mm, I see. First of all, how long ago was this breakup, both between your children and the subsequent, I guess, you know, pause in your friendship? 18 months, 20 months. Uh-huh. And when the kids stopped seeing each other, was it amicable 
It was a simple growing apart, but my daughter was the one who ended it. But other than that, there wasn't an incident, a fight, a betrayal, anything like that, mm-hmm. I, which mm-hmm. feels silly to talk about for middle schoolers, but. <laughs> well, not really. I mean, middle schoolers have the full spectrum of human they emotions. Do. They do. We do when we are that age. Yeah. Um, so this has been very difficult for you, I, I understand. And I guess I'm curious about what are some of the feelings that have come up for you in the absence of this friendship? I miss her. She was in my inner circle. And yet, part of me is a little angry because Mm -hmm. I feel like our friendship was collateral damage. And yet, at the same time, I can't be angry at her because I love her. And Mm -hmm. I want to leave the door open. And we've had that conversation. And she has said, not now. And Mm -hmm. when a year came and went, I thought, maybe now. But we saw each other in passing at a party, and it was simple, small talk, very superficial. And that sort of made it clear that that's all it was now. My door is open. Her door is not. And do I have to make peace with this, move on so I can let go of some of this grief? Or do I fight for the friendship? That is our question. And to help Alice sort this out, Carvel brought in Carissa Potter. She's an author and illustrator and the founder of a small printmaking workshop called People I've Loved. She's also the host of a podcast called Bad at Keeping Secrets. But most importantly, she's someone who loves parsing through complicated feelings in relationships and helping others do the same. Carissa joins Carvel and Alice right after the break. This show is brought to you by Discover. You know, in today's world, it seems the best treatment is reserved only for a few. Well, Discover wants to change that by making everyone feel special. That's why with your Discover card, you have access to 24-7 live customer service as well as $0 fraud liability, which means you're never held responsible for unauthorized purchases. Finally, no matter who you are or where you are in life, you'll feel special with Discover. Learn more at discover.com slash credit card. Limitations apply. This podcast is brought to you by Slate Studios and SAP. AI is moving so fast. If you don't get reliable and relevant advice, your business might miss out. Welcome to Dear Artie, an advice column from SAP, where we tackle the tricky questions at the intersection of AI and business. Here's our expert, the technology futurist, Ian Kahn. Hi, I'm excited to dive into today's question. Dear Artie, as our company expands, so do our hiring efforts. How can AI help us attract top talent? Signed, Searching for Higher Power. So, Searching for Higher Power, one of the most daunting undertakings of an HR leader today is building a new team and finding and vetting new talent. This is a very time-consuming process and can take precious organizational resources. As a companion to the HR team, AI technology can be used to create job descriptions, analyze candidate resumes, and filter candidates into various pools based on experience, skills, or any other parameter. You can also use AI to match internal talent with positions available. Parameters for this can be set, rules can be set, that can all be done through the algorithm. There are so many things that we as humans could be not looking at that AI can do in a matter of seconds. Embrace AI with confidence. Head to sap.com slash AI to learn more. Carissa, I think it's safe to say in a messy situation like this, there aren't really any right answers, right? But there maybe is usefulness in talking it through with others. You're someone who who has thought a lot and written a lot about relationships and, and friendships and breakups. And so I'm curious how Alice's situation is striking you upon first hearing it. In some ways, it's like experiencing a death, also a, a mourning of the loss of the future that you had envisioned with this person. And if it's okay with you, could we have a name? It's not her real name, but we can call her Grace. That would be lovely. 
So I can really relate to this because my best friend moved away during the pandemic and she decided she was going to move to Italy. I felt really abandoned by her, but I can't be mad at her because it was the best decision for her family. And it still is. But every day I, I miss her and I'm on this like active hunt to like replace her. And I know that no one can replace her because she's so infinitely special. But this sort of like, when you were talking about earlier, the idea of what does fighting for a relationship look like? For me, it looks like, and it feels like letting go. I don't know. How does it feel for you when I say like looking for someone else or, or trying to find like a new friend that would kind of provide the connection that, that you had with Grace? That very much resonated with me because it feels like giving up mm. to move on. And yet this grief is making me afraid of my other relationships. Oh, gosh. Mm. Yeah. You know, you don't make that many friends uh, as readily, or easily, uh, deeply, and in this case, fast. My friends who have children around the same age, I'm scared to death that my daughter, my child, might do something that offends them, and I will lose them. And that is holding me back from being mm. my full self, expressing my love for them, uh, and making me afraid. How is this also affecting your relationship with your daughter? She doesn't know that the friendship is gone. I've never spoken to her about it. Mm. Right or wrong, I didn't feel like that was her burden or to feel any responsibility whatsoever because it is separate. Mm -hmm. As a parent, I have to say, I really relate to that choice. Okay. Y you know, this... <sighs> This um, raises, like, I think that one of the core emotional issues here that keeps coming up for me is like, we fear loss, right? I mean, mm -hmm. sometimes we would rather not even be intimate in love and, and not experience that connection and enmeshment if we think it's going to be broken at some point. And I'm wondering, Carissa, what you think about the sort of the kind of like prevailing notion that it's better to have loved and have lost than never to have loved at mm. all kind of thing. Like how much should we be protecting ourselves from like the pain of loss versus how much should we be sort of showing up fully and just being like, let the chips fall where they may. Everybody's threshold for <laughs> emotional experiences is different. I personally, right. um, it's better to have loved and lost than never loved at all. I'm not addicted to drugs in a formal sense, but I'm definitely addicted to affection and mm. like being chosen by someone else and mm. feeling that security that you feel. Mm -hmm. But with that, I feel like humans understand through contrast and I need to have the pain or the, the heartbreak to be able mm. to really appreciate the state of that high. Do you think that in some ways, because of the timing on this, uh, it's extra intense because of experiencing the same parallel trauma as the world shutting down? Uh, yeah, that's a good point that it probably did ramp up the intensity. We were surprised by people in our lives um, when they established that their priorities were not the same as what we thought they were. Mm hmm. So it kind of in some ways feels like you've been sort of abandoned now by everyone because there were groups of people before who maybe had differing views, but then the person you found who was kind of your confidant and who accepted you mm -hmm. also has now left the situation or yeah. hasn't, yes. has changed her mind. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Over something that I, in my mind, have probably deemed as insignificant as asking a parent to wear a mask and then refusing to. That is right. how I'm right. feeling. It, you mentioned a few times in your, like kind of explaining the situation, that feeling of, you know, you could call it political isolation, but I don't think this kind of isolation is political. I think it's very personal and emotional because part of what makes COVID so intense and makes other quote unquote political issues so intense is like, 
you realize you're separated from people, not by ideology, but by an actual relationship to life. <laughs> you're like, wait yes. a second. I thought we were sort of like, you know what I mean? Like, is that really how you view life and <laughs> the lives of others? Like, I, I feel quite alone in this. And so when you meet someone who is like, yeah, right? Like, uh, I agree. There's a feeling of like, okay, finally, I'm not alone. And I think everyone's, a lot of people's political intensity around the current issues, whether it's war, genocide, COVID, abortion, it's not about fucking opinions. It's actually <laughs> how people view life. Mm -hmm. And so everyone is feeling a little abandoned. No matter where you are in these issues, there's like a separating that makes you feel like, oh my God, I'm not even the same kind of human as these other people. And I think there's a lot of fear and panic because humans are social creatures. We're like, well, where do I belong? Who's my tribe? And so then people become really intense when they find someone else that they relate to and those tribes become really tribal. This is my theory yeah. about what's happening. It was exactly that. You described it well. So then that makes me wonder, even though this person is gone, they haven't changed their beliefs, right? They haven't been like, oh, actually, no, I've, I've like reneged on all of the stuff we agreed on. I'm now on the other side of the scale. Correct. They've just said, I can't be in a current relationship with you because of whatever reasons. Mm -hmm. It makes me wonder two things. One is um, if you can still feel that connection, that at least we know we're on the same page about this important life stuff. And then it also makes me wonder if it's possible to find other people to co-live with, to do Tuesday night friendship with. Hmm. Uh, that's a difficult question mm -hmm. because uh, making friends as an, an adult with children with lives just mm -hmm. isn't as easy because you don't have the time. Mm -hmm. um, and you can make the mm -hmm. time, uh, but your lives have to overlap in some way. And I do have other friends that I, who are in my inner circle, I, I value and would fight to the ends of the earth for our friendship. And those friendships are still intact right now? Oh, yes, very much so. Uh -huh. I talk to them about uh -huh. the loss of grace. Yeah, yeah. For me, I, I always thought that like true friendships had to have time. There was some part of the equation that time, and it had to be a long time. Like the intensity and the shortness didn't necessarily compare. But I do think part of the magic and the intensity of this, did you feel when she stopped the relationship, how did that change the way that you viewed her? So I just want to clarify this question because I'm not sure I fully understand. Are you kind of getting at the idea that maybe the loss heightens the attachment? Correct. The feeling of attachment? Oh, I see. That, that's interesting because um, my daughter was on the receiving end of a, of a breakup this time. And she told me that she could only remember the good times all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. um, mm. And I would say it's not, it's not similar to that. I just feel a loss of wanting to grab my phone and send her a funny note or tell her a story that happened today. It is closer to an uh, unexpected death. Mm. Mm -hmm. This sort of gets to like the million dollar question of this episode, which is, and I'm curious your thoughts on this, Carissa, like, should Alice let it go or hold the door open on this friendship? I feel like they're not mutually exclusive of each other. Um, I, I wonder, knowing that you can't have Grace back, what do you need? Mm. That's the question. I have two parts of my mind. One is very analytical, um, and the mm -hmm. other is just raw emotion. <laughs> um, you and sound I'm like, like you, a human being. <laughs> I, I imagine. That's, that's all I claim to be. Not to diagnose, but you might be a human being. Uh, like, oh. Yeah, I've, I've heard that before. I should have that checked out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I, I, part of me hates being a human being. I, I want it to yeah. make sense. I want it to be logical. I want it to be black and white. And I would like you to give me the answer of if I should pursue this or if mm -hmm. I should mourn through my steps mm -hmm. of mourning and, and move on. After the break, an answer for Alice. Yes, really, don't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. 
Apple Card is the credit card created by Apple. You earn 3% daily cash back when you use it to buy the new Apple Vision Pro or any products at Apple. And you can automatically grow your daily cash at 4.50% annual percentage yield when you open a high-yield savings account. Apply for Apple Card in the Wallet app on iPhone. Apple Card subject to credit approval. Savings available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility. Apple Card and savings by Goldman Sachs Bank USA Salt Lake City Branch. Member FDIC. Terms apply. Hey, I'm Becca Rashid of the Atlantic's How To Podcast. Yeah, our podcast name sounds similar to the one you're listening to right now. But with our season, my co-host Ian Bogost and I get deep into the complexities of time. Time allows change to happen. It allows you to change. On How to Keep Time, we combine philosophy and self-reflection with interviews and social science reporting. Listen to How to Keep Time wherever you get your podcasts. Hi, I'm Adam Grant, host of the podcast Rethinking, a show where I talk to some of today's greatest thinkers about the unconventional ways they see the world. On Rethinking, you'll get surprising insights from scientists, leaders, artists, and more. People like Reese Witherspoon, Malcolm Gladwell, and Yo-Yo Ma. Hear lessons to help you find success at work, build better relationships, and more. Find Rethinking wherever you get your podcasts. Okay, we're back with the final episode of our special series on friendship. If you haven't heard the first two episodes, definitely check them out. And if you have, you might remember Emily from our episode on finding friends in unexpected places. All right, the hunt for Marta, her long lost friend, is on. She's gonna sign up for ice skating again and see if she can find her, and she's already planning for her cross-generational dinner party. After we talked, Emily went on this trip and pushed herself to make some older friends, one of which it turns out lives in her state, and they're getting together soon. These are the updates we love to hear. All right, on the other end of the spectrum, let's get back to helping Alice, who is struggling with a friendship breakup. I'm gonna hand it back over to Carvel and our expert, Carissa Potter. I think, unfortunately, accepting that it is going to be sad and that there's probably no timeline that it's not going to be painful in and that you're not going to grieve it and that it's probably going to show up again with different events through the rest of Mm. our lives. But trying to seek out other moments with other people who make you feel good I don't know. I'm of the opinion that when people think that there's a very clear direction to go in, they're missing vital Mm. parts of the context. (laughs) And I think like figuring out what you need to kind of, if it's, if it's moving on, if it's sitting in the grief, if it's figuring out what kind of you need and, and nourishing that would be my my take on it what i'm really asking if we boil this down is how do i make the hurt go away and Mm. i know there is no actual answer for that but the bigger question i do feel like i'm in a state of suspended animation Mm -hmm. and it's not in my control it's uncomfortable very uncomfortable for me and so that's why i was hoping there would be an easy answer to make the pain go away and that's magical thinking on my part, I know. But um, that is what I'm asking, right? Yeah, to some extent it is. But, I, it, you know, it's funny. The phrase that's been popping through my head this entire conversation is, and I forgot where it's from originally, I'm sure others there's no, but this quote that what is grief but love persevering. Oh. Um, I've been thinking of that sentence f- actually for the last few days. Like I was on a hike hmm. yesterday in New Mexico and for some reason that phrase popped in my head and it was like, oh, I get it now. It's love perseveres after the breaking event. Like the event happens, whether it's a death or a breakup or a friendship is lost or whatever, but then the love perseveres and that's what grief is. I ha- I still have all this love, but now I don't have the container for it. That is beautiful. And that is an answer. Yeah, this is what I'm thinking. And so it's interesting because you said that you felt like you were spending a lot of time and energy grieving. And I thought that doesn't quite sound right to me that your the time and energy that feels 
extractive isn't necessarily grieving time and energy. It feels almost like it's the ener- time and energy it, it takes to be in suspended animation, hoping that maybe this change can be undone. Yes. That things can be unchanged. And that that is what feels like it takes up a lot of energy and you can't move forward. And it sounds like what Chris is saying and what I've sort of seen through my own experience is that once you accept that it's not up to you whether the change is undone, it certainly could be, but it's not, I mean, it certainly could happen, but you don't get to control whether or not it happens. Then you can actually move on with the actual work of grief, which is sitting with the persevering love that continues to roil around in your system without a place to be held and that causes sadness and wailing and you know but that but that that's what we do after we lose someone whether we lose them to death to a breakup to friendship whatever but that's what we do and i we've talked to so many people on this show about losing relationships and that's the one thing that i am re- now realizing always comes up once it's over you still have to keep loving not only that, but you you don't just stop. And this unties that right. knot for me because I feel like it's the love that's been banging its head against the wall, let me out. And if I think of it as grief is simply love persevering, that gives it a reason for being the grief, but it also doesn't tell the love to shut off. It tells the love it's real yeah. and it continues. That's right. That's right. That's right. The love doesn't shut off. The love doesn't shut off. And yes, and I was thinking of it as grief is the slow shutting down of love, but love was not going to let me do that. Love was still banging its head against the wall. Mm -mm. And -mm. this, (laughs) you can think of it so affectionately then, not like grief, I got to get over this. I got to get with the program. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, that's right. What are your expectations around grieving and and loss about what it should look like and how long it should take? Oh, I bought books on grief, right? What is it, the how many steps, the seven <laughs> steps? Be- because I wanted to get through the <laughs> yeah. acceptance and moving on. And, and so I wanted to do it in order yeah. and I wanted to get it done. <laughs> so I would say unrealistic. Yes, because there will be a yes, test exactly, at the end. So let's right? make sure that you... <laughs> Can you tell I'm an only child? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, this this is such a solution for me. I can't I can't overstate this. That it now mm. doesn't make grief and love um, enemies here, but it gives them both a graceful mm. place to exist. Yeah, I think what people like about that quote, and again, I think it's from a movie or something. That's I should not probably a, Google it's it, not but a like yeah. Colleen Boss quote, is it? The famous line, oh, <laughs> the famous line is said by the character named Vision in the TV series WandaVision. Wanda? Oh my gosh. <laughs> I've never experienced loss because I've never had a loved one to lose. But what is grief? If not love, persevering. It's so timely because that was like one of the big pandemic collective experiences was everyone was watching. Only the greatest philosophers, yes. (laughs) (laughs) Getting on this phone call, I wasn't expecting any any resolution. I I guess I'm sort of taken aback in some ways, like shocked again that somehow, (laughs) Harville, you were able to read the situation that Alice was in and, and find comfort for her. I was not expecting resolution either. I had someplace written in a question that I thought maybe could be an interesting topic that I could listen to on the podcast. And then uh, Rosemary contacted me and said that they were gathering experts. Like I was actually going to find some advice and I was hoping that I would move a step or two in some Mm. direction that would ease, but I was not expecting this. And If you keep asking the question, this has been my experience. I don't stop asking the question until I find this. Yeah. This piece. And this eases all the tightness that I had. And I'm so grateful. Oh, that's so lovely. That is so great. I'm so happy to hear that. And I would also even say that, like, let's not give too much credit to this conversation. I know that we, like, had a breakthrough here. But, like, you, my experience of this 
as a person who's been through things like this before and and all the physical stuff happens that like the anguish and the loss and the feeling of like you're like a baby bird and your mother's gone and you don't know where you're gonna get food from and all that you know just like even though i'm a grown-ass <laughs> man um we have this conversation now 18 months after this event has happened so you've been able to progress through some of these elements like if I came to you the day of the breakup and was like, hey, where does grief but love persevering? You might be like, go shut the fuck up. Like, I'm not trying to hear that right now. <laughs> so like, so I think that there is compassion in letting it take to time. To sit with the question. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. And it's not about like finding, like plugging in the right solution so that you solve the equation instantly. That there's actually, that there's a compassionate way to let it, just let it well, take Let time. me be clear. If there were a way to make an algorithm that took this way, I would do it. I would do it. <laughs> this is a much yes, harder way, but you would. real. <laughs> it is real. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I just want to say that I have loved this conversation. Thank you both so much for showing up here and giving what you have given. Thank you so much. I feel the same way. I would just like to say I would like to be friends with both of you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Alice. <laughs> Love it. Thanks to Alice for coming to us with her question. If you have an ending that you need help navigating, give us a call at 646-495-4001 or write to us at howto at slate.com. Be sure to check out all of Carissa Potter's wonderful work. We'll link to it in the show notes. All right, so that does it for us today. But listen to all the episodes in our friendship series for February. If you missed any, they've been a revelatory joy to work on. And if you like what you heard today, please give us a rating and a review and tell all of your old and hopefully new friends. That helps us help more people. How To's executive producer is Derek John. Joel Meyer is our senior editor. The show is produced by Rosemary Belson with Kevin Bendis. Merritt Jacob is senior technical director and composed our theme music. Charles Duhigg created the show. For Carvel Wallace, I'm Courtney Martin. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.